Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Open Source and Business. This is the last episode of our, our current season. Uh, we've been doing these for uh, several months now, since, since the fall. And uh, it, it's a series of conversations that I've been having with experts in their field about all of the different ways that open source plays a role in industry at large. And we've gone from everything from uh, finding VC and, and putting together a pitch deck for, for, for a VC for a startup to you know what? What kinds of things do you need? Should you be thinking of if you want to get a job in open source? So everything from, you know, how people are creating companies around open source to how people are using open source uh, in their business. Um, and today I'm joined by two uh, experts in their field: uh, Craig Kirsteens, who is the product manager for Crunchy Data right now, and has a long history of uh, becoming uh, an early stage startup product manager. Uh, with multiple startups, and we'll hear about that a little bit later. And Anil Lakani, who is uh, an experienced uh, product manager, uh, product marketing uh, e executive for, uh, for for multiple startups as well. Uh, and we're going to talk about that inflection point where you go from founder and technology driven in a startup to uh, bootstrapping uh, product management team, bootstrapping product marketing and, and sales teams, and kind of really defining your go to go to market and and how that transition. Um, can go well and how it can go poorly and, and what kind of things you need to be thinking about as you go through that. Uh, so, Craig, can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, what are some of the companies that you've worked for um, and, and uh, kind of basically what, you, what, your, uh, what your thoughts are on this topic at uh, high level? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I've been uh, mostly at early stage developer data product companies. Going back, I was one of the first product managers way, way back a, a number of years ago at Heroku in the early days there. When I joined, I think they were about 20, 25 folks um, and, and grew that to, you know, pretty large scale as a part of Salesforce. Um, I think when I left, there were about 250 people and a product team of about 10 or so. So um, kind of took that from no product organization to, you know, here's an actual product team focused on dedicated areas. Uh, left there to go to Citus Data and ran product and pinch hit for the first year and a half and ran marketing, which turned Postgres into a sharded distributed database. Uh, and they were acquired by Microsoft. And then I came over to, uh, to kind of do it all again at a smaller company at Crunchy Data running product now, uh, really kind of all things Postgres. So mostly really developer tools, often in that open source space, um, I guess pretty much every single one, uh, open source, um, that early mix of, you know, product, what is product management, product marketing, how do we kind of define that? And I think, you know, I was talking with Anil and, you know, the, the biggest advice is, you know, don't do it unless you're ready for some pain um, as a role. Um, you're, you're signing up for a lot of kind of uncomfortable conversations and pain and, and hard work. Um, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Uh, but it's a very interesting dynamic being that kind of uh, the, the next first adult in the room with all the founders. Right. And Anil, you're East Coast now, past time. You've been in the West Coast. I, I've, I've met you several times in, in Monktoberfest. We're all regular Monktoberfest alumni. Uh, looking forward to getting back up to Portland this year, assuming it's on. Um, but uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience that you that you brought to brought to bear on product marketing and, and how you see product marketing and product management playing off each other? Because I know that's something that you know, we've talked about in the past. Uh, sure. Uh, like Craig, I've been first in a role in marketing at multiple startups. Um, very technical, very uh, technical products for technical people, engineers built this for other engineers kind of situations. Um, I, I have somewhat of a weird background for someone who does marketing insofar as I came up in distributed systems engineering and went from there into product management and went from product management into marketing, which biases me as a heavily product oriented marketing person. So I, so people tend to think of my specialty as product marketing. Um, the what product marketing is varies quite a bit from organization to organization. There are like two or three different traditions in technology about what that is. There's a tradition that's more like an IBM kind of tra tradition, but there's a different tradition that's more like a Google kind of tradition. And there's like a third tradition that's more of like a VM or kind of tradition. And if you haven't been around long enough, you don't really know, you know, how these histories came to be and, and what bucket you fall into. Um, but, but generally speaking, the product marketing person is for the kind of startups and technology companies that I deal with is typically the first 
marketing higher because the problem they're solving is one of telling the story of the product and explaining it to other people, to whatever wider audiences beyond the circle that looks immediately like the founders who built the product in the first place. So in, in your experience, does it does tip, does, do these functions typically get started before or after an initial kind of funding uh, round happens? Uh, is it kind of one of the functions that spins up after a funding round? I'm, I mean, I imagine it is, but I'm, I'm curious. There, there, is, there is no answer to this. What I, what I tell people is as soon as you get to the point where, where you are expanding your circle of users and or customers beyond those who have a inbuilt, native, intrinsic, zero effort understanding of what you're doing and why it's important immediately on like 10 seconds of the first conversation, you, you need to do product marketing. Now, where that falls in the life cycle of raising money is, is sort of orthogonal. Okay. Yeah, early, early on, you, you have 10 or 20 or 30 friends or people that knew you from building this thing inside of Google, and now you're turning leaving and turning it into a product, or you've seen this three times over, and these other people have seen it exactly the same and know you. Like, as a founder, you generally have some network. That's pretty quick and easy to sell to. Um, or you're doing the... Uh, hey, we're going to sell to you and we don't know what we're building yet, but we're going to solve your problem. So we sit down and we don't really have a product yet. So that early, early stage, but as soon as you have a thing that starts to be repeatable, well, how do you communicate that, the value, the problem you're solving, the um, the Dave McClure, like pitch the pain, right? What is the pain that you're actually solving versus here's this technical thing for technical sake? Okay. The I reason think, I asked is because um, uh, I think there's, one of the things that I have in, in my mind that's a, that's a kind of a job one for product manager or product marketing, and I'd be interested to see where you see the, the line falling, uh, the, the boundary between the two, is kind of defining that product market fit, uh, defining the value proposition, figuring out you know, how you're going to do uh, pricing, positioning, um, even working with the tech technical team to work out you know, how are we going to turn this into a product. Right, so it's almost like driving the engineering roadmap as well at the very early stages. And I'm wondering whether those are the kind of things that need to happen before you get a funding uh, round or, or whether um, they're the kind of things that happen when there's an influx of cash, right? That, that, that's basically... Yeah, let me, uh, let me say something before I address that. Uh, and the thing I want to say is that you have to differentiate between needing a specific job to be done and needing a human being to do it because you know i gave you a criteria for when product marketing needs to start being done and thought of that doesn't mean that you need to go get a person to do it that just means that that is now an additional job in the organization that someone has to do and maybe you don't specialize on that someone until some point in the future and it just becomes an additional hat that a founder wears or that someone else wears and and i think I assume Craig's going to agree with me that that's true for product as well in the beginning. And I, I think in the beginning, like Emil's a product marketer that has a product management kind of background and probably a little stronger of a slant on the product management side. As a product manager, I've pinch hit and run marketing multiple times. So um, I think you find that early stage, it's a, I could go run product marketing or marketing or do sales ops or, you know, engineering management. My bread and butter is definitely product, but I think you need a lot of flexibility in that early stage. What does a first product marketer versus a pr first product manager look like in a very early stage? Is this is the first hire? Probably not too overly different. Like you're probably doing a lot of the same things and yeah. then over time you, you get someone else in to fill that piece that you don't want to be doing as much. Right. And now, right. The, now the second thing before you continue, I want to do is to address what you just asked about funding. And I want, and I want to challenge you or I want to ask that you that you consider inverting your thinking about it. Because the question you asked was in the form of, where, where do I put roles or activities or things that I need to do as a company or as a builder of a product or a tool on a funding life cycle? And, and I really think you should think of it in the other direction, which is to say, where on the path to building my thing and getting people to use it and, and growing its customer base or not, or just growing its user base, 
do I want to attach funding? Because because the purpose of funding is to grow your thing, whatever your thing is. And so and so you don't th so you shouldn't be thinking, uh, you know, once after I raise my seed round, I'm going to hire a PM. You should be thinking, I'm going to raise a seed round to go from a a technology to a product. So I'm going to go pitch a technology that gets turned into a product, which means that 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 money that I raise in the seed round, its purpose is to get me to a product. What do, what do I mean when I say a product? Who do I need to hire to make that true? And what are the things I need to accomplish? Right. Because then I'm saying the next time I raise money, the purpose of that money will be to take that product and insert it into a certain market and get a certain amount of success in that market okay. or usage of it. And then you think, well, what do I need to do to do that? I like and that. That's the one that uh, six months ago or so raised a very large C round. I think it was a 40 million valuation at their seed stage. And there was no product to speak of. There was an open source GitHub project. And now we've got to say, okay, well, how do we, like, what do we charge people for, right? It's open source. Here it is. Now, you know, yes, that's growing. Like we've got users and stars on GitHub and all that, but what's the product? How do we make money? Right? Like that's, that's the next stage. And they've got to figure that out no matter what, but like it was, Hey, we can raise money on this traction of GitHub users. It really depends on your space and you know what you're doing, right? right. A database space is very different from a open source framework for JavaScript, right? How do you monetize those is completely different. I guess that's, um, I, I really like the way you've presented, Anil, the, the it's more of a, here's something I'd like to do. If only I had the resources, let me go and find the resources to do it. Uh, but I'm also thinking that there's uh, there's an opportunistic, you know, we have a thing that's hot in the market right now. Uh, we could probably get funding now in six months. Will we, will we be, will the same topic be available? Will capital be as freely available? Um, I imagine there's a, there's something, uh, some thinking along those lines that happens in startups as well, right? There is there. I mean, there is a lot of the environment right now is that if you have a GitHub project, that's in an obvious space that's growing and you go from nothing or a small number to many thousands of stars in a short enough time period, investors will throw money at you. So that's the environment we live in right now. And opportunistically, often the right decision is to take the money when it's cheap and you, you have all the leverage. Uh, so you've both joined companies early. Um, as you both said, it's like sometimes you're more product manager, more product marketing. Um, how have how difficult has it been when joining a company to uh, convince a founder, or if that's even the process that happens, that they should let go of something that they've controlled before you joined the company? Uh, I imagine that's like a pain point: is is that you know you're coming in, the founders done everything, um, or the founding team has done everything, and now they will you know is there is there, is there a pattern? Is there a a kind of a standard way that these things happen? Yeah, it's generally, it's super painful. Like you just get chewed up and spit out. You get told, no, you have to prove your case so much more firmly just because, you know, the founders, you know, they have built this baby, right? Like they've gotten to this point. They've done a, a ton of, of work to go and, and build whatever tool or project or product. Um, and now you're taking it away and taking the power away. And for all your experience previously, you weren't the one that founded the company. So you've got to have the, you know, the, the higher ground to stand on. Um, you know, over time, we, we like to use a saying within my teams, uh, if we've got data, let's, let's use it. If all we got our opinions, let's go with mine. Well, that works out you've proven yourself. Right. But like the founder has that position, that pole position right away. So you've got to really kind of, for me, it's finding some quick wins and building blocks and kind of show and build to that credibility. But also the first time someone new comes in, more often than not, I see them chewed up and spit out. Like they, they don't last, they don't work out for whatever reason. Some of that's a learning curve from the founders. Some of that's, this is their first time doing it. If it's your first time doing it, expect it. Um, you get hired as a, a VP of product, a VP of product marketing, a VP of marketing at a startup, and you're the first other VP lead title. Um, you're not coming in there, making all the calls and the decisions. Your your job now is to convince the founders of every decision and thing you want to do. And they're just going to slow you down and feel like they're, you're, they're stalling you. So it's 
that's what you're signing up for, you've got to really prove yourself along that journey. Um, it's bumpy. Now, the first person that does it kind of makes it easier for everyone after. <laughs> the next VP of whatever that's in the, the you know, parallel department or the, the VP of product that comes in and replaces you after, you know, it doesn't work out for you has a smoother ride. But that first one, it's, it's bumpy for sure. I 100% agree with everything Craig just said. Even, even though there, there is quite a bit of variance founder to founder, this pattern generally holds. The position I sit in now is coaching founders through this process versus being on the other side of it where, where I was the chewed up and spit out part of the process. And it's, it's interesting that they, that oftentimes they're fully aware that this is a thing that needs to happen and they're just challenged in doing it. And it's just a personal thing because, because, because this is a high risk situation for them where, where they're moving from controlling the majority of the variables that produce the output that is the company to losing control of the majority of those variables, losing direct control anyway. And, and in order for them to let go, they need to have trust in the new person. The new person has to earn that trust and there, there's a tension there that Craig talked about, but also new people often know that what, the, what they're signing up for is this situation and you need to make space for them to you know, mess up every right. now and again, or often on the path to figuring things out. And that is tough on all sides. I think it was uh, Joel Spalski who wrote about, um, as a founder, he always wanted to do any job that he was going to hire somebody to do first so that he would understand what it was, what was difficult about it, understand that he sucked at it and understand what, it, what qualities he was trying to hire for. Um, I imagine that not every founder does that. Have you ever arrived in a situation and found that, you know, a founder truly believes that they they know better than you what you're an expert at? Uh, I've yeah, I've I've been in both situations. I've I've been in, you know, I've been in a situation where a founder is desperate to stop doing something and wants someone to take it over and they they actually give it up too quickly, which can be a thing. And because you 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 might still need them, right? Uh, on the flip side, I've been in situations where the founder really wasn't hiring a leader. <clears throat> what they were hiring is someone who could execute what they wanted and run an organization that executed their directives. They just needed to scale their ability to, to tell people what to do. And that was the purpose of hiring a leader. Yeah, I've definitely seen both. And I think there's there's always, in all cases, I've seen this kind of inflection point where the founder gets to the point where they realize like we've got to scale more than just me. Like that's the founder. Like you can hire the the people that go and execute kind of the direction and, and the, Hey, I'm the founder. This is what I say. And you hire a bunch of essentially kind of middle management that goes and executes and, and does it well, but there's still way too many problems at, you know, almost any size company, but you hit a, a 20, 25, 50 person company. There's too many problems for one or two founders just to solve them all the time. So you do right. need to hire those kind of people that lead. And there's a, this may not be as good. Um, one of the Heroku founders, he did very much the same thing that like, I'm going to go and learn how to do this job and hire someone for it. Um, the problem was he did them all spectacularly. Like the way he dug in and learned them, it's like everyone that came after, you know, he's holding this bar. It's like, I'm not a salesperson, but here I learned how to do this. Um, he studied how to write for the Heroku blog by studying the blog posts, like reading every single blog post one of the other founders had had written, looked at which ones did well on Hacker News, which ones, like what was the tone of voice, why, like he turned it into a pure science and not an art form. And I mean, it was not fair to follow in his shoes. And, and <laughs> like now I get to write this launch blog post and he just like took a red line to it that it was, and he's not a marketer in any shape, form or fashion. He like just applied this scientific process to it. Um, those those are the ones that it's hard, but I love working with where they've learned the job, they understand, um, they have this empathy towards it and they're gonna try to make you better along the way. Um, if you find one of those, like hitch yourself to their wagon for sure. Um, for many, it's a it comes back to this conversation where Hey, yes, this may not be the best way. I agree. This is not the best thing that we could be doing, 
but the trade-off is, is this, like, if we don't do this, we can't scale, right? Like, how would you propose us solving this problem in a way that allows us to scale and do this, the next person and have someone else making this decision. And usually they don't have a good answer and that it takes time to digest, right? Like change is hard for any of us. Right. So laying that out there and kind of bringing them along to that journey is, is really important. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the work rather than, you know, the founders and the dynamic around the, around the starting. Um, one of the things I like is, is about product management and product marketing is it kind of covers the whole gamut from user research, market research, all the way to, you know, what's the support experience and what's the after sales experience that you have uh, through sales enablement and, you know, defining the product roadmap and, and, and actually building the thing. Um, I imagine coming in at an early stage startup, you do a little bit of all of that. Um, as things evolve, you know, which bits do you tend to let go of first? Or which which bits do you focus on? What's is there is there a kind of a pattern of the things that need to be done first, second, third, and uh, like how you approach the job holistically? Uh, Anil, do you want to take that one first? Sure. I don't think there is one pattern. I think if you really wanted to, you could break it out into a set a small set of patterns that depend on some combination of the nature of the product, the nature of the user or consumer or customer of the product, and the nature of the market that you're in. And you could probably come up with three or four patterns that are consistent. Um, the way I approach it holistically is the only way I, I know how, which is to not think about the function when you're first, but to think about the company or the team or the product, right? And think, okay, uh, I am. this is an open source project that we're gonna turn into a product. So what are the problems I need to solve along the path to that? Some of those are, is it possible for me to transition from users to customers? If so, how many users on average, can I turn into customers? What does it take to do that? What, what are the bounding conditions of the thing that is a product versus the thing that is a project? What things am I gonna charge for? What things will I never charge for? What is the set of experiences that I want people to have when they first encounter the project, when they use it, when I attempt to sell it to them versus them using it? when uh, once they're sold and they're customers, what does that mean? How does that experience change? So this is the way I think about it, right? And, and, and you would have a different set of questions if you're, I've built a software as a service offering that uh, has, has a free tier that's targeting marketing people for doing a vertically specialized analytics job, right? Say I'm building a marketing specific amplitude. And 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 the set of questions that I would come up with is like, what do I need to accomplish as right. an organization that's doing that right now? And and it, it there's things that fall out of that that are specific things that I have to do in my function that feed into that. So you kind of analyze the whole thing as a pipeline of of you know Customer yeah, I think, and user acquisition all the way to you know monetization conversion. I, yeah, I really think you have to. I, I don't I don't think you can be successful otherwise. And what's what are the most critical what are the most common like initial bottlenecks? Is the is the initial bottleneck typically mm -hmm. and typically is probably a word that you can't use in the context of startups ever, right? But is it typically around uh, differentiating product and project in open source companies, or is it uh, typically around uh, you know, raising awareness? Is it around, you know, getting the technology right? What's, what's... I mean, in my experience, what I've seen is usually that first onboarding experience because the founders, like, I see more now that that's pretty, pretty okay, right? They have a, hey, here's a good readme, here's a good, you know, repo on GitHub. We, we, they've done user testing where they've gone and said, like, okay, I'm going to watch you on board to this in 30 minutes, right? And, and smoothed out that. That's that's fairly common. The next step of, okay, well, what, how do you, yeah, I think Anil hit on it, you know, what's a user, what's a customer, what do they pay for, right? Um, for most dev tools and data tools, like 
to me, it's a, okay, what do they need in production, right? Is it security stuff? Is it SSO? Is it this kind of visibility or operation? Like, can you, you want as many people using it as possible. What are the things that are really needed in production? You can charge for that, right? You charge when they get to production. So do you have those kind of, of filters? There's a lot of just tactical pieces that I find that people are just not doing, um, especially if they're an engineering background, like start a newsletter. And they're like, but we don't have anything to say. Just capture their email. People are going to give you their email. And otherwise, this person that came to your website is never coming back unless they happen to, you know, your messaging was that good. And, and like, just start the basics. There's so many low hanging tactical pieces. Um, record notes on all your meetings, right? Like save this in, in a Google drive or Salesforce, right? Um, the low hanging tactical pieces are ones that like, just start doing some of those, just start doing them really quickly. Um, I tend to come in and, and have a framework I use called kind of a, what I call a gritting exercise. It's like a three by three effort versus impact matrix. And we'll just put it on the board and uh, low impact, uh, or sorry, low effort, high impact is in the top right quadrant. And then you have, you know, the, the really hard to do things, high effort, but low impact in the bottom left. And, you know, the scale of this could be uh, like, people get way too hung up on when it's engineers are like, okay, is this 1.5 weeks of effort or two weeks? I'm like, you get three boxes, put it side by side and you see where this is, right? And it, it's really illuminating because it, it says as much of anything, like there's an endless set of things to do. You put a bunch of things on the grid, you put 20 things on and you put boxes around the five based on the you know rough, like which way is the wind blowing estimate? Right. And then all these other things we're not doing. The, the we're not doing this is as huge as everything you can do. Like do those things, build the muscle, get them well. You know, a newsletter is one of those things that I mean, everyone I talk to like, okay, you're capturing an emails here. Have you sent a newsletter? Like just send this once a month. Um, they're like, yeah, but it takes us two days to do it. Well, the first one does. And the next one's a day and the next one's four hours and it's two hours. And then you build this muscle. Now add one more thing to that toolbox. Um, there's a list of 30 things you've got to do. Start with one, get good at it, then move on to the next. I cannot overemphasize the concept of building the muscle here for these things that you don't know how to do. So there are big things you have to, you have to do immediately on day one, which is figure out what the product is, what the boundaries are around the product, the thing that you want to monetize and make money for, figure out whether or not it's actually, you're right, can you make money off of them? We'll just go test out the idea of people saying yes to giving you money, figure out how to talk about it in a way that minimizes the amount of time it takes for someone to understand what you're saying and for them to say, yes, I'm interested in that or no, I'm not. So reduce that friction to as close to zero as you can. If you can't figure out how to get a yes or no out of someone in let's say less than a minute, keep working on it because it's not good enough. And there's a ton of listening there. That's the thing that I think is hidden is it's um, you can ask people yes, no, or this or that, or you give the pitch and it kind of works. But there's, you know, if you come from a consulting or sales background, you listen to these hidden kind of things of, oh, did you notice they lean forward in that point in the conversation? Like that was the thing that triggered them. Okay, now pull that forward and see if it works um, on other people. And and then as Craig said, there, there's an endless supply of things that you could be doing. And, and to some degree, it almost doesn't matter which of those things you do, as long as you get into the habit of doing some things on a regular inviolable cadence. Because, because the world of sales and marketing especially is things have to be done on a cadence. And, you can, and once you start doing them, you can never stop. A hundred percent. It truly like it is way, way better. And I think coming in as the um, some founders have an analysis paralysis of like, well, how do we know which thing to do? It doesn't matter. Pick a thing and do it and get better at it and then do the next thing and then do the next thing. The the best, best product managers, product marketers are going to be right 51 percent of the time. That's fine. Just do it. If you're wrong, then quickly get good at it and then move on to the next thing. And, and stop doing things that aren't working. Just stop. It's, um, 
yeah, it's um, one of those things that uh, um, in the early stage, there's just so much stuff you could be doing. It's it's kind of hard to choose. But yeah, as, as you say, it doesn't really matter in which direction we're going. As long as we're kind of generally going downhill, we'll get into the valley at some point. I think the big key is saying no to a bunch of things, like not trying to do the 20 things all at, you know, 50 percent effort, because then you don't know if they're working or not. If you say these are the five things and we're going to do them, make sure you're you're doing them and do them well and get good at it, build the muscle and then go to the next one. Right. Uh, that saying no is really, really important. So do you think it's more important to do five things really well than maybe 10 things not so well, but they're all getting done? Yeah, I'm squarely in that bucket. That, that yes, focus, put the wood behind the arrow, build the muscle. You know, if you can't and you fail at it, okay, set it aside and go to the next one, pick it up. Okay. But if you don't do it well, you didn't learn anything. You don't you don't know if you can do that or not. And, and another another way to think about this is doing one thing well is what earns you the right to go do five things and doing five things well is what earns you the right to go do 10 things. If you if you start out trying to do 10 things and you suck at all of them, you're not going to get better at one of them because you're spending too much time doing the other nine. Right. And then you can start to hire the specialist too. Of, oh, we're, we're really good at, at events. Cool, now we can go hire a dedicated events person. Like you can kind of carve out those specialists. Generalists, generalists that can do the five things or the 20 things are really rare. Um, specialists are much easier to find and hire. So once you're really good, and this is, is key for your, your pipeline and growth and all that, great, offload that job and pick up the next one. Cool. So how much have you gotten involved in bootstrapping a sales organization or go-to-market motions? What, uh, is that something that's part of the scope for product manager, for example? Uh, squarely several times, and then I fired for myself from that as, as fast as possible because I don't want to be a Salesforce admin. I think... Um, there's a lot in that early stage of you solve whatever problem you need, right? And um, early stage sales, you it's very founder driven, very product manager driven. Um, people want to talk directly to the engineers, not to a salesperson, right? So um, it starts a lot there, and then there's a question of, hey, I'm a I'm a another tool in your toolbox. Use me, right? Like pull me into calls, talk me up this way. I show up for 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm I'm covering a bunch of emails in the background, but like my presence there can help, right? How do you get this a scalable process? Part of it is that listening. What's the message? And then how do you take that message from the sales organization and then blast it out on the website, right? And in your blogs and then all this other content. And like, what are we missing on the, the product side that makes it easier to sell? Is it SSO? Well, that's not the hard engineering thing to build. Why, why would we prioritize that? Well, because everyone's gonna pay for it. So being coupled in is, is very important there. Um, for me, a lot of it is in that early stage communication is huge, both like connecting the dots to sales, to marketing, to um, to all the areas that the founder just did it before. And there's this inflection point where, oh, we've got to explicitly communicate now. Oh, yeah. Gotta... Go ahead. That feedback loop was in the founder's brain and now it's going through multiple people and you you have to tighten it, have it be as tight as humanly possible, which for me in the early days, often means that uh, I have often been the person who runs the first meeting, who does the demos, acts as sales engineer, acts as sales rep, because you just have to. Also, you just can't talk to as many people as you want to if you, if you pipe it all through one human being. And in the extreme case, I've been at companies where every exec in the early days had a quota because, because every exec had to know intimately what it was like to try to pitch someone and try to get them to use the product or try to sell it to them. So they, so they understood, you know, where the friction was, where the corner cases were, what, what a good customer looks like, what a good user looks like and what bad ones look like. Cause there's such a thing as a bad user. There's such a thing as a user who, who will use your product in a way that you don't want, you didn't build for going down a road that you have no intention of going down, who, who can derail your entire organization. I, I've never heard that one, but that sounds like a ton of fun of every exec having having their own quota. I've I've not heard that one, but that sounds like a, a fun playbook. People don't like it, but it works. <laughs> um, so uh, you've, you, when we were talking before, you said there's a kind of a playbook, um, Craig, uh, a, a series of things that tend to happen in in order as as you join a company and the company grows. Uh, the kind of the the 
speed bumps that you trip over. Um, can you run through some of the some of the typical stages, the more fun ones that people might be surprised by? Yeah, I don't know that any of them are, are that fun. It's just a clear process, and you run the process. Um, I think you know a lot of times you show up, and um, there's uh, the first question is like, is there a velocity problem? Is there a problem with shipping? Right, and you then you go and fix that. Like, okay, we need to, to get this out of the door and how and what's blocking that. Um, and then then you kind of go from velocity to quality. Um, it's, it's kind of in each area too. On um, You show up early and there's no management team meeting. So cool, you get to have the first one of those. And we rotate through, you know, on a weekly basis. Let's talk about sales as a group. Let's talk about marketing as a group. Let's talk about product. Let's talk about engineering. Let's talk about HR as a, a leadership team. Wait, we need to talk about HR? Like it's, yeah, it's important. Um, all these things. And then, then there's the stage of, well, we need to communicate them out to the team. Um, like, oh, you don't have an all hands meeting? Like this is a thing that like can, can go on forever at a company and, and founders not realize. But we said it at the all hands meeting when we sat around a lunch table. Now we actually like, but we're 50 people. And if you do the math, at least two people are out every single week then. But we said this announcement at the all hands meeting. How did you not know we changed our product roadmap and direction or pivoting? Well, no one told them because they assumed we communicated. So now we've got to write everything down and email it out. So it's very, very clear. Um, you know, for me on the, the marketing side, I'd be curious on Anil's kind of playbook. For me on the marketing side, it's some of the things I mentioned, like, cool, capture emails, start a newsletter, ask people what they're doing, start a drip campaign when they, they sign up for the, the project. Um, do the research on the person, right? Uh, there's good customers and bad customers, but um, before I, I kind of think about it as a concentric circle, like here's the person that's perfectly in our target market. If they have five of these things, I can go close this. If they're in marketing and their stack is Django and their database is Mongo, they're my perfect customer. None of that may have anything to do with the product and the technology, but we've closed those all repeatedly, right? And if there's one thing off about that, if they're Java instead of you know Rails, oh, now they're out to this circle. So the odds of closing them is 50%, right? And I'm gonna focus on those things. So there's uh, finding that repeatability and, and getting it really to a, a science. Um, you know, on the, the product side, um, it's a lot of like, it doesn't need a big, feature launch, it's, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts. It's focusing on just making it better, gradually making it better, gradually making it better, building up velocity. Um, and then you start to figure out R&D, right? So now it's a, what's this completely new orthogonal thing? How do we go and practice building that and then figure out how long it takes? Um, one of my colleagues has a principle that it's, he can build a prototype and then the time to actually take that prototype and bring it to market is, the prototype was one fourth to one tenth of the time to build the real thing. And it actually works really, really well. And truly we like have gotten good at throwing away the prototype and then go build the real thing. Um, you can't just go ship the prototype to production, but if you wanna know if this new product or project or kind of feature is gonna take three years, well, can you build it in three months or can you build it in, in one week? How do we just get better at doing more of these things and communicating them throughout? Um, it comes in all sorts of different kind of, uh, phases and, and stages. Um, how are you from a product manager, product marketer? Is there a repeatable first call sales deck, second call sales deck? Like it's sales creating presentations on the fly for every single customer. Like these are all things that happen at that super early stage. You show up at a, a Microsoft and there's 230 sales decks for one product. Right. Um, but you've got to start of like these repeatability of like, how do we get basically start to scale things? Yeah. I, in some ways I'm totally opposed to the idea of playbooks, but, but that's unfair because if you have sufficient experience, you don't need one. Uh, in, in other ways, I find them extremely necessary to articulate facts that people don't aren't talking about and need to be talking about. Uh, so the, the way I think about this is that let's assume you know what your product is. Uh, the next thing is you have to figure out who it's for, and it's not always self-evident who it's for. Craig's approach of concentric circles is actually the same one that I take. There, There is a ring zero, which is 
the perfect person for whom this product is a perfect fit. They have some problem. They know they have the problem. They've been dying for a solution. They will, you know, um, they will run into a burning building to get that solution if it, if it was available to them. Right. And and they're the right size. They're the right shape. Like say say you say it's really better if if like you're 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 doing something where it would be ideal if the person consuming it was a deep Go programmer. So like your universe of discourse now shrank to Go programmers, right? So ring zero is whoever for whom it's. A, an absolute yes, and it's yours to mess up. You have to do something to turn the yes into a no. It, it's it gonna be, be to talk to a, a DevOps engineer and not a CTO, or vice versa. It, like every like, what's the perfectly repeatable thing yeah. that it's? You know. So, so one of the first things my a playbook is is to is to clearly articulate what is ring zero, what's one step out, what's one step out, what's one step out, and then draw a line and be like, we're we don't care about anybody who's past ring two. I'm doing ring zero, ring one, ring two. That's it. Um, or we don't care any, about anybody who's past ring zero. I only care about ring zero. And and the important part about this is you don't waste anyone else's time. You also don't waste your own time. So you don't you don't waste time talking to people who you're not focused on right now. So that's right. important because then everything else you do is optimized for the people who are within that boundary that you've drawn, right? And then you think about, um, you know, if you're a marketer, you might think of this in terms of a funnel or a flywheel or a cycle. If you're a salesperson, you might think of it in terms of a sales cycle. But if you're a founder, you need to think of it in terms of a customer journey or or what is the full life cycle of experience that a user is going to have with you from the first time they hear about what you do until they stop using it or they churn, right? Like what is every step along that process? And in the beginning, you really focus on the beginning steps and trying to make it as easy to consume and as frictionless as possible for to go from, I just heard about this project to I'm up and running with it and it's made my life better. Like what, like how, how far can you possibly reduce that in a meaningful way? Right. And one, once you've done that, the next is thinking about monetizing, right? Like what is like, what am I going to charge people for? And how how much can you reduce how much can you reduce the I have value, I perceive value to I'm willing to pay for it. And again, you think about it the same way. There is a set of steps, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the set of steps is or how you carve it up, as long as you do carve it up, and and then and then you're like, I know that this step has been accomplished, and now we're moving to the next step, and I have now a framework for optimization, and I can make an informed choice that I'm going to optimize steps two, three, and four, the expenses of steps one, five, and six. That's fine okay. because you can only do so much in a given amount of time. So, so the playbook that I approach this with is figuring out what, how to carve things up in a way that everyone can agree with. And oftentimes I will give, like I usually come into it with like, this is what I think the model is. And then people argue with me and I'm like, I don't care. We'll go with your model. I don't care what the model is, as long as there's a model that is stepwise so that we can decide what we're optimizing right now. Okay. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like it's, and I th like, I'm a big fan of like kind of content driven marketing versus, you know, kind of demand gen. Um, and like on content, they could read your blog for 12 months before they ever kind of pick up a phone and give you an email and talk to you. But like, that's part of that, you know, whether it's funnel or that journey, like knowing that that's those steps and then how, what can we shorten, right? Like there's things you can shorten. There's things you, you can't, which ones do you optimize? Uh, Echo and Neil hundred percent there. And measuring each step of the way is important, presumably. Yep. Yeah, but don't don't get yeah, don't get sidelined by by measurement because because for for example, a, a collection of uh, qualitative results is a quantitative result as long as you have a collection. So like everything doesn't necessarily need to have a number. If you if you get a lot of positive responses to a message, that counts as that's a good message. Okay. You can, you can, I've seen people way too much on the web analytics side, like how did they find us and try to spend six months instrumenting, you know, multi-channel attribution and all that. Whereas I just get on a sales call. I'm like, Hey, I'm, how's it going? How's the weather there? How'd you hear about us? Yeah. Cool. That, that just told me everything I need to know about my funnel of what's working. Like right. I didn't spend six months engineering it. Like don't agree. Yes. Measurement's important the whether it's qualitative or hard quantitative or like what's what's a thing that gives you that that direction to go um so pricing 
I imagine is one of those things that's uh, tricky, right? You you mentioned it there, Anil, because do, do you come at pricing in general from a from a kind of a value minus or a cost plus or you know it because whatever price you put on it is going to be too expensive probably except for your ring zero where it's like we'll pay whatever it costs i if you have the too expensive like actually you're doing okay like anil smile go ahead anil no no you you should finish your thoughts um in a lot of cases pricing is heavily coupled to the value you communicate i think it's actually more important the harder thing is why should you pay us? If you're open core, that's okay. Why, why do I need the enterprise features? Um, if you're a SaaS model, it's way easier. Like there, the SaaS model, there's enough kind of frame of reference in the market. Like you're running a service. Okay. You're exception handling. What are the other prices of exception handling? Right. Um, oh, you're, you're doing one person's job. So I can price, uh, you know, right below uh, hiring an engineer to do this, right? Um, in the SaaS market, I think it's way, way easier. It really depends on the type of product. Um, in an open core world, communicating value is the hard part, right? Um, in a SaaS product, it's a little easier and you can have those tiers. Like SaaS product pricing to me is not a hard one. I don't know if any of would echo that or not, but it's, you know, you swipe a credit card and then the hard part is you never put limits in there and you never like find those triggers for someone to uh upgrade like the one of the when i ran the heroku add-ons marketplace i would i'd talk to all these add-on partners and they're like hey how do we make more money i'm like okay do you have limits and they're like yes do you enforce those no classic could you, could you enforce them well yeah but that's engineering work well like how how would you like me to go and make you more money without that so <laughs> um it really does depend on on the model, um, but I think the price is not the hard part. It's the communicating the value and the why. You do that, then increase the price, increase the price. Um, there's a, a good book I like to recommend um, uh, by one of the former Redgate folks, uh, Usually Short Guide to Pricing. Um, don't just roll the dice. I think it's a free PDF you can go and download. There's certain APIs in pricing where at a Microsoft, I can approve X dollars on a credit. I can expense X dollars on a credit card as a principal PM. And then as I go to the next level, then it's, okay, this is my without approval of the next level. I I don't want to go ask for approval for anything. I want to, I'll happily pay for so many things. Um, yeah, I think the book title is uh, Don't Just Roll the Dice, A Usefully Short Guide to Pricing. Uh, it's like 40, 50 pages, if I recall. It's not long. There's a bunch of these API things that are useful in pricing. It starts at the value, though. Okay. Uh, I think my, my view on this has changed quite a bit over the years. I used to think pricing was hard. Now I think pricing is, is dramatically easy. And, and the problem is not with the pricing. The problem is with with the people who are coming up with the prices who, who are looking for magic that does not exist and cannot be expressed in a number on a pricing page or in a quote. Generally speaking, at least in my experience, uh, pricing either is a value-oriented thing or a cost-oriented thing, right? And, and the, the way I think about it is you want your pricing as much as possible to scale by some unit of value. And the hard part is figuring out what that unit of value is. And the unit of value is not something you decide. The customer decides what the unit of value is because they're the ones experiencing that value. So if, if, if the unit of value from your perspective is a, a, customer, um, a, a customer running a query, for them, the unit of value might not be running a query at all. The unit of value might be my end user who is a salesperson loads a dashboard. That's my unit of value, right? So what is the best proxy for that thing that you can charge for and that your price scales against? That's hard. If you can figure that out, the, the rest is easy. Then, then, then you're just, you're just going to charge what, what you can get people to pay. 
Um, and and knowing whether you're coming from that cost center side or value driving side, right? If you're value driving, you're over on product or sales or marketing, your, your cost, you're over on ops or whatever, just like, this is just the cost of doing business. Knowing which side you're on, super important. If you can get to the value side, great. You can charge so much more. Like then, then you're not tied to the, the, you know, your underlying costs and it's not a, a race to the bottom where everyone's trying to minimize costs. But if you are on the cost center side, that's fine. Just know you are. And then like, okay, well, how can we, you know, drive our cost of business down? And like, yeah, it's going to be commoditization. So it's about scaling up, scaling up, not, you know, increasing within an account, know which side you're on a hundred percent. If you can move great. But if you can't, don't, don't kind of, you know, sit there with rose colored glasses of, yeah, eventually we're going to communicate this value from right. running the server. Another way of thinking about that is uh, you, your, your pricing falls into a bucket of comparables of other things that do similar things. Your, your pricing has to be meaningfully comparable in a single human being's brain without them breaking out some spreadsheets. Right. right, or else, or else you have become difficult to do business with, and how you and and you would have to provide an extraordinarily, an extraordinary amount of positives. Because to to be difficult to do business with, right? So so you know if you are, if you are a you know database as a service product, and every database as a service product is priced as either A or B, and you want to do something wildly different. The what you need to justify doing something wildly different is provide wildly enormous value or be wildly cheaper or else you don't get to do something wildly different. So, so th there are externalities that bound what you can do here. A perfect example there of like being able to move from that cost side over to the value side. Um, so uh, Citus is a sharded distributed database. Um, a thing that would happen is you'd have one really noisy tenant within there. Oh, this is a really large customer, a lot of data consuming, a lot of resources. It's negatively affecting performance and then, you know, the experience for all these customers, uh, for all the other customers and for themselves. Well, okay, uh, that's a, a pain and a cost. How can we like make this a better? Oh, well, here's this ability to isolate the tenant over to their own dedicated resources. And now, well, but it was bad before and I still just need to keep running. Like this is just like cost of running my business. But I, I've been on many calls with product managers on the other side where they're like, I'm like, well, what if you could sell this to the customer that their resources are now isolated? So now we've isolated this tenant. They're like, oh yeah, I can charge three X on the price of my product now for that. Cool. Like this is no longer uh, just the cost and I had to eat this anyways. Now I can pass this directly back on as a, a value add, a an upsell to the customer. No problem. I'll pay like, right. tell me what it costs. Like that's, that's the response is like, this sounds great. How much is it? Oh, cool. I'm just going to pass this directly back on because I can at uh, this kind of upsell. And presumably the, the only way to find out what that point of value is for your customer is to talk to the customer, right? Or potential customers to do that. Yes, kind of you have to talk to people. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah, you know, the, the business would be great if it wasn't for the, you know, the customers and the employees and, you know, the people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've uh, long held the philosophy, you know, um, one great way to keep 100% customer satisfaction is just fire the unhappy ones. Like, it's, it, it works. Then, you know, like, you don't have to worry about the pager or support tickets or all that. Like, everyone's happy and just doing their stuff. It, right. A great, great business model. It works until you go out of business, I guess. Eh, details, details. <laughs> Um, so thank you both for joining me today. Um, we're coming up on the end of the hour. Is there anything uh, that you feel like we haven't covered uh, that, that you feel is important to people who are listening to this, who, who are in this stage of their career and uh, in this stage of their startup maybe and, and uh, are, are wondering about this, uh, this, this inflection point, this, this starting up a, a product or a marketing team? And you'll go ahead. It's hard. It's not. It's not going to not be hard. You should be adjusted to the fact that it's hard, and be prepared to deal with it. Yeah, and I think it's echoing on that. It's okay. It's going to be bumpy. It's going right. to be messy. Um, you know, it's a uh, when things aren't going well, tensions are higher, and you feel a lot more that pain. When things are going well, it's a little easier to kind of roll with it. Um, and try to remember, it was hard for everyone else too. It was not easy for anybody. 
<laughs> yeah. Even, I mean, on the founder side, on that, you know, first PM, PMM side, um, expect it to be lumpy. It is for everyone else. And on the uh, on the graduating side, right? You've both moved on from uh, from the start from the startups as they've grown. Uh, Craig, you know, obviously Heroku through sales, Salesforce and and Citus through Microsoft. You've kind of gone back to the startup. At what point do you start to, uh, as a startup person, feel out of place? What's what's your what's the point where you start to think uh, maybe I need to find a new project? Yeah, it's a great one. I mean, it really varies and it, it ties to so many other things of like stage of life, right? Like um, the big company is very different. It's here's my lane and I'm in that lane and I know what to do. I'm not excited by it always in the same ways, but at times like I can go and add a lot of value and um, I don't have that. Like you've got to refresh your batteries after that really hard push that, hey, you get things working and I want to enjoy them for a little bit, right? Like I, I built all this up. I want to, you know, reap some of the benefits of, of all that hard work, and then, you know, then you get the itch again, right? Okay. Uh, it's it's definitely a balance, but I, for me personally, it ebbs and flows that way, right? Like I, I get it working, I want to enjoy it. Okay, now it's it's not challenging in in those ways, so let me go and try it all again. Right. Right. I, I, is that, is that our truck? Is that on your end, Anil? Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. I was just curious. Um, I hope it's not your building. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any final words, uh, Anil, on that? On that kind of the the moving on and letting go of your baby and finding another one. Uh, it happens. Don't worry about it. Right. Well, thank you both for joining me today. Uh, this will be going up on YouTube a little bit later today. Um, I'll be licensing it under uh, Creative Commons unless you have any uh, opposition, any any objections to that. No, sounds good. Uh, so it'll be Creative Commons. It'll be up on YouTube. Uh, this is the end of our second season. I'm taking a few weeks off, and we will be back again with some more speakers, uh, some more episodes of this series. I'm interested, by the way, in any ideas uh, that you or or anybody else has. So we have a mailing list, a newsletter, which you should sub subscribe to. Um, that was uh, part of your your sign up process. We also have a YouTube channel which you should uh, subscribe to and hit the bell and and uh, receive notifications of future episodes. And if there's any subjects that you'd like to see covered, you can send me an email at dneary at redhat.com. I'd love to hear your ideas. And um, thank you both for joining me today. I'll see you both soon. Thank you. Take Bye. care.